All right. Good evening, everyone. Happy Hump Day. It is Wednesday, November the 11th. And welcome, welcome, welcome to the conversation. I am so glad you took some time out of your evening to join us. We've got an incredible episode tonight where we are continuing the evolution series that we began back in September, where we were talking to and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with some incredible artists as we talk about the evolution of various genres of music. And in this particular series, what we talk about is, or what we are, have been talking about has been the evolution of jazz, the evolution of hip hop, the ev evolution of R&B, and the evolution of gospel. So if you are just joining us, make sure that you, if you've not already done so, make sure that you like, follow, and subscribe at all things at the Convo Pod Show. So if you've not already done so, I'd ask you to take a quick moment, go over to the go over to the Conversation with Yolanda Trauma YouTube channel, subscribe there. And of course, if you're not following us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, everything, everything is at the Convo Pod Show. So to bring you up to speed, um, the this particular series of called The Evolution has focused on, as I said, many different genres of music. We kicked off the series with our first guest on Instagram, Anthony Hamilton, and then we followed up with um, uh, our first in the Up Next series where we're talking to other artists who are up and coming. Um, we had Demi Day and Elle Lambert on that episode. We then followed up with um, Adrian Crutchfield, and we talked about his evolution and the evolution of jazz from his perspective. And then we um, took a break and then came back with Melvin Crispo III, and we talked about the evolution of gospel and his incredible story um, as far as becoming, um, surviving so much issue, so many issues in his personal life, and of course, becoming the juggernaut of um, the gospel industry as he has become in, in the past year. And then our last episode was the evolution of hip hop where our guest was none other than Grandmaster D of Houdini. So before we get into this particular episode, again, if you've not already done so, like, follow, and subscribe, feel free to share. If you're catching us on the replay, definitely make sure you share this episode. This is an episode that's particularly special to me because it is one. it, it, it does cover one of my favorite genres of music, jazz specifically, and someone that I've been following for quite some time, and she just happens to be a star rock, but we'll get into that in a second. Um, and also, of course, um, definitely want to take a moment to thank all of our veterans, this being Veterans Day, so definitely want to shout out all of those, those of you who have served in the armed forces in whatever capacity. So if you are tuning in, make sure you drop us a wave, let us know where you're, where you're chiming in from. But our guest, I am so excited to have her on the show. If you have, um, if you've ever been a fan, and I always have to preface this because I didn't know this until I had done some more research on her, but she, she is a, a person that as soon as I say the name, you're going to remember the scene. So if any of you have watched The Color Purple, which should be everybody that is tuning in, um, if you watch the scene in The Color Purple in the church, um, and the young lady who sang the solo of God is trying to tell you something. That is our guest, Miss Maria Howell. And that takes you back to 1985 to the beginning of her career, which is, has spanned the has spanned from television to movies, of course, the stage. And if you have ever seen her perform live, it is not just a show. It is an experience. So welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. None other than the fabulous, yes, Sora, yes, honey. Welcome <laughs> to the show, none other than my fabulous Sara and just absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal song stylist, Miss Maria Howell. How are you doing, sis? How you doing? I am doing great. I am well, you look right. fabulous. Let's just start there. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's it's been a it's been a joy ride this 2020, hasn't it? For all of us, for all of us, for sure. Yeah. So, so check in. How are you? So, how are you? Um, how are you adjusting? How have you been able to pivot? We'll get into obviously who Maria is, but how have you been able to kind of pivot in this in this time where we're so used to being able to come together and enjoy music? Well, it's been many phases, many phases. Mm -hmm. As I was telling someone recently, the first month I was feeling like I was on vacation. Right. <laughs> And then the second month, I was going, oh, you need to get a job. Right. And then the third month, I was like, OK, learning curve on like steroids. Um, <laughs> I have learned <laughs> I have learned so much about technology that I did not know. I, I always make a joke like I'm real text like 
tech challenged and I mm-hmm. am. Um, but it's been such a great experience to be able to dig down and find out and learn things about myself that I did not know that I was capable of of doing. So yeah, it's it's been a phase, phase thing. Oof. Every month I, is different. And I'm sure for everybody else too. Absolutely. So for those people who don't know who Maria Howell is, give us three words that would describe you. Maybe four. Well, I might give you okay, another. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. start with three. I, I, no, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, child of God. Um, mm-hmm. I think that was like three words. So I took mm-hmm. up three. Um, I'm dedicated. I'm committed. I am kind. I am loving. Mm-hmm. All That's- of that. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So for those of you tuning in, definitely wave. Denise McNeil is is sending a big wave. She says she was your neighbor on Marietta Street in Gastonia. Who was it? Denise McNeil. Oh, she took me way back. Yes. And we're going to talk about that. So, yes. But so for for those people who don't know, you are a North Carolina native, Mm -hmm. originally from Gastonia, a.k.a. the Gas House. Gas House. (laughs) So um, um, now are you are. Let's go. Let's start. Let's start first with family. So um, born and raised in Gastonia or just that's where you that's where you began. Born, raised, elementary, junior high and high school. OK, yes. so tell us about your parents. And are you an only child? Or you have siblings? No, I'm not an only child. I'm the oldest child of six. Um, mm-hmm. I've got five other siblings, one brother and four sisters. Um, mom and dad, buddy, well, William Buddy Howell. We all affectionately call him Buddy. Well, I call him dad, but everybody around town called him Buddy. Mm-hmm. And I'm on Virginia. They're both uh, deceased now. And so it's me and the siblings. And we all grew up in Gastonia. All went to Hunter Huss High School mm-hmm. and, and graduated and, and went on to do different things. Um, you know, it, it, we are very, very close-knit family. And... Mm-hmm. Me being bi-coastal, it, it, it's really cool during this pandemic that I've had an opportunity to spend more time on the East Coast. So right. a chance to spend more time with my family, even in a pandemic, uh, spending mm-hmm. more time with my family as far as like we get on the Zoom meetings, we'll do the drive by birthdays and all that kind of thing. So very close knit family. Mm. Yeah. And so your your parents, what parts mm-hmm. of you do you see that came from them and their own personalities? Are you more like mom or dad? Like what parts of their personalities do you see now more that's than ever? Good, that's a good question, because on different days, I see more of my mom and me. And on mm-hmm. different days, I see more of my dad. My dad was very direct. He didn't bite his tongue. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm a, I would consider myself to be a little bit more, so, more soft in comparison. Mm-hmm. But always willing to deal with stuff. Yes. You know, um, my mom, very graceful, gracious, loving, kind, serious, serious woman. She didn't play, very mm-hmm. wise. So I see some of that, the older I get, the more I see my mom in me. Are you, do you come from a musical family? I do, actually. Um, my mom sang. We, um, I grew up on the choir at St. Paul Baptist Church in Gastonia with mm-hmm. the same choir because our church wasn't that large where we had the children's choir, the, the mm-hmm. teens and all that. I mean, we would all get one choir. And then on good days, we had a men's choir. So, <laughs> <laughs> special occasions. Um, right. You know, so it was like the teenagers and the adults were on the same choir until later on. Uh, I think they probably had one. Make a long story short, she sang. Um, my mom knew music because she used to play the trumpet before I was born. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So she had a beautiful voice, beautiful voice. Um, so, and she was actually my first teacher because I remember being in high school, I would come home with music and try to be prepared for, for choir. And my mom would help me learn harmony. Mm-hmm. She did the same for a couple of my siblings who played clarinet and violin. She could transpose music. And so she really was a great at home teacher that, that supported us. Interesting. And plus, and plus we have other musicians across the family that play organ, play guitar, um, piano, drums, it, d- different instruments and singers. Cause a lot of my family, uh, they sing. And so for you, when did you start singing? Obviously as a small child in the children's mm-hmm. choir, but what age do you recall that you had your first moment where you knew that this was something that you really loved to do? Cause I'm a PK, I, I didn't get forced into the children's choir. Thank God, because they don't want that. that. They, we didn't have a children's choir. Right. It, 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 it <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. It, I was at the age of 13 mm-hmm. uh, that I clearly remember, because um, that was the first 
time it was an organized situation where I was on a choir and they gave me a solo because I never really wanted to be out front, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and Worthy as the Lamb was my very first solo. Wow. And so what when in that what in that moment made you know that this was something that you wanted to do beyond just Sundays or, or whenever you were called to sing? Well, I knew before that I mm-hmm. knew at the age of six what I was going to be doing in my life. Um, mm-hmm. And it wasn't so much that I was strong willed um, on that. It was just I knew it innately mm-hmm. and spiritually. Um, so by the time I got to the choir, it was the simple thing of. I'm just in the path. You know, right. I'm, I'm walking the path of where what, what I'm supposed to be doing. But yeah. I do remember the first time on the choir when someone shouted. Mm-hmm. We came from a church that they didn't really shout mm-hmm. a lot. And when I, it scared me when I first okay. went, like, going, ah! when they did that thing, like how mm-hmm. it scared me um, yeah. because it shocked me. But at the mm-hmm. same time, I said, oh, there is something that I'm doing that means something. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't to show off or anything. It wasn't to, to an ego stroke. It was nothing like that. It was like God gave me something to do. And mm-hmm. so I, I, I wanted to do my best to do it. Um, of course, we go through phases of hard headedness and, and stubbornness throughout our lives. But it, all in all, I knew that God gave me something and a sign. And, and uh, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say. And, and in addition to that, I was also singing in a gospel trio uh, mm-hmm. when I was in high school uh, with one of my dearest, dearest friends who's gone on. She's been deceased for quite a while, Robin Rowe and Donna Lawrence. We sang in a gospel trio called RDM. And so how much of an impact do you think that experience growing up in the church shaped you when you got your big break and when you started doing things that were not gospel related? How, mm-hmm. how much of that was um, shaped by your church experience? Oh, it was the foundation. It, mm-hmm. You know, it, it was a foundation simply because the choir director at my church didn't, he, he required us to sing a lot of choral style. Mm-hmm. So I got a lot of that good rudiment uh, foundational learning. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then so it supported what I did when I was in school. Then okay. it supported what I did when I was in college. Then it supported what I did professionally. So I got some good training when it wasn't even professional mm-hmm. and paid training. I just had some really good teachers around, including my mom. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I need to clarify, Denise, that I think that her maiden name is Meeks. She said Pastor yes. Dawn. Yes. yes. So I, she wanted to. That was next door to me. Yes. So <laughs> she wanted to definitely send out a wave to you. I see you, Nick, Tracy, um, Sandra LaPronda. Um, show, send us a wave. Let you let us know where you're watching from for sure. And of course, if you know or have questions for Maria, drop them in the drop them in the comments. We will see them and we'll get to them. Oh. OK, so let's fast forward now. You're 13. You know, this is the thing. Mm-hmm. Did you have now you were still focusing primarily on gospel at that point? Did you have any inkling of how you were, how your career was going to evolve from there? Or did you consider yourself or think that you were going to remain a gospel singer primarily? Oh, no, I, I had no clue. All I wanted to do was sing. Uh, because when I was in high school, uh, different bands would approach me about singing. And I, as much as I wanted to join a band, my mom and dad wouldn't let me. Mm-hmm. They were like, you get your college degree first and then you can do what you want to. So, and, and I'm very, very glad they did that because it took the desperation out of me. Um, and it probably, and I'm sure, I don't even need to say probably, it, it saved me from a lot of heartache um, or lessened the heartache because I think you bump your head no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, so no, I did not know specifically. I just knew I wanted to sing and act. Mm-hmm. And there were things that came between, lessons that I had to learn to sustain me. So I didn't start professionally singing till The Color Purple. Wow. Mm -mm. And so where did you end up going to um, undergrad? uh, Winston-Salem State University. Got to give a shout out. Got to give a shout out. Rams in the house. (laughs) I can't can't say that without uh, giving love to Hunter Hus, Husky, Mm -hmm. because I still still love me some Huskies too. But Winston-Salem State University, HBCU. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now, were you... um, Focused on music then, or did, was your major something else? Well, this would be sweet. I was a non-music major. Um, Interesting. I'm a pre-med major. I, I 
uh, graduated with a BS in biology, minor in chemistry, mm -hmm. but I was always in the music department. People thought I was a music major. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's huge. Knowing that that was your background and that's where the assumption was, or at least that you have that dual love, uh, mm -hmm. obviously for science and chemistry and all that. So was it a hard decision to make a decision to say, mm, don't know if I want to go in this route. I still want I still want to be an artist. No, it wasn't. It wasn't a matter of a decision. It was just what it was. And I knew at some point I would be singing full time. Mm -hmm. Although, like you said, I, I did love the science because I had I had a microscope when I was a kid. I was always wow. analytical and always trying to dig into stuff. But mm -hmm. um, no, I, I was coming from a small town and not really having a lot of people around or right there accessible to me to to help guide me to a school of the arts or mm -hmm. or whatever. I did what I knew how to do, and that was go and do something practical. Mm -hmm. The rest would be there. I didn't worry about it. Outstanding. Okay, so now you graduated. You, they say, you can do whatever you want to do when you graduate. <laughs> so tell us, of course, I'm so fascinated with the story behind the color purple. I did a little bit of research back behind that. Mm -hmm. um, got several sorrows that are tuning in now. Did you um, now? Did you pledge in undergrad or was it alumni? Yeah, I pre pledged undergrad. Okay, so mm -hmm. once again, we got we got a shout out to sorrows. Yeah, just, okay, fun. okay. Gamma okay. <laughs> y'all know we can't help it. We can't help it. Hey, Nick. Hi, hey, Montre. Hey, Sandra. How y'all doing? So like I said, for those of you tuning in, drop us a wave. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, see you, Montre, all the way down in San Antonio. Thank you for tuning in. All right. So let's talk about the color purple. Okay. So how I, I, we got to hear the whole story because we all remember how powerful that scene was mm -hmm. where, you know, you're singing and you know, of course, the door bust open and just your facial expressions and coming. To, girl, let's get into it. Let's get into okay. it. Okay. All right. I'll take you back from step one. Okay, um, please. At, at, right before the Color Purple auditions happened, which happened on the campus of A&T, that particular audition, the cattle call, really, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, I have been doing some acting and singing with the little theater in Winston-Salem. You know, uh, North Carolina, because after I graduated, I stayed in the city. So someone um, told me, said, look, why don't you go and audition for this movie, The Color Purple? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know what The Color Purple is. I had never heard of it. I hadn't read the book or anything. Right. Mm -hmm. And me and my, believe it or not, bashful self was like. Hey, bashful? Wait a minute, ma'am. OK, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm going to let you finish. Me being, <laughs> me being, me being, um, how do I say, the confident, seemingly confident uh, out front person, it, it was a learned behavior, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I did not want to be out front. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm shy. I'm just saying I was bashful to sing in front of people by myself. Mm -hmm. So I was like, no, nah, I don't think that's for me. And they were like, go anyway. And so I just trusted the folks because I was living with this family when I graduated from college. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones that told me about the color purple. So I went and there were about 5,000 people there. I'm, wow. I'm saying about 5,000 people because it was like an eight hour day of, of taking groups on stage, them saying, thank you. That's it. They didn't ask us to sing or anything. And so I was toward the end of that day. So that's why I say eight hours, because I remember eight hours. Now, this is during the time of uh, cell phones weren't popular. OK, my age and myself. Okay. No, you know, because I think we still had the flip green one with the giant battery. Yeah, child, yes. Thought we were doing something with that green screen with the giant battery. It was like this big. You were doing and had a, that with the antenna, like that was really gonna make a difference. Anyway, I digress. I digress. Okay. So that 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 uh, bit of information will come in handy when I'm finished telling the story. Okay. So um. I went and auditioned, like I said, eight hours later, um, we got off stage in a group. And some of my girlfriends from college were actually at that audition as well. And we went up in the same group because we hung out all day. So I get off stage and I'm going, hmm, I don't want to just go home. So I went back up to the casting director and I said, hey, excuse me, will you keep my photo on file? Because I had a photo. Not a true headshot, but I had a photo. Mm -hmm. So I went back up to her, said that, and, she, and I said, oh, and by the way, I sang. So something said, spirit said, tell her that. Don't know why, just tell her. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And she was like, well, what do you know? And I cut my hand to her ear and I sang, God bless the child. Mm -hmm. 
no music or anything like that. And, the, and that she said, well, do you know any gospel? And I'm like, sure. She said, well, go take five minutes, work something out and come back. And Sean Lucky, was it Sean Lucky? I think that's his name, actually worked over um, on the um, campus and he helped me. I don't think it's Sean Lucky. It's like, I can't remember what his name is that fast all of a sudden. Anyway, he helped me out. I went back up on stage, but this time I was by myself. Mm-hmm. And so that was my screen test and I didn't realize what it was. I was just so satisfied just to have my photo in her hands. That was it. Next day, and I was working on the campus. So I had a regular job. Mm-hmm. I was starting to become a real adult. And so the next day I get a call and they're like, oh, we'd like for you to be a part of the choir. I'm like, that's all it took for me. I was like, yes. But then when I went down to Wadesboro, I had to audition again for the solo spot. Mm-hmm. And here we are. So it was that kind of thing. It was as simple as that. But the person that went to bat for me, Stephen Ray, who was Quincy Jones' right-hand man, mm-hmm. he wanted to go against the grain because th- there was a different description of what that choir soloist was supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. And he was like, no, I want to use her because I want, I want somebody that looks like my mom did. His mom evidently was on the choir when he was growing up. And it just made him feel like she looks like my mom. She reminds me of my mom. And that's how I got. So I, I believe in divine and uh, divine intervention. So that's what that was about. So after it was filmed, it took about a week to film that scene. I read the book while I was on a set and it was a great experience. Met lots of good folks there. And then I went back to work uh, business as usual after it was over until it came out. And then at the rap party, though, um, the band that was performing they somebody said, well, since you're the choir, choir soloist, why don't you sit in with the band? And I sang a song with the band. And the next day the band called me and they were like, can you come down and be a part of our group? Mm-hmm. I was, you could have just knocked me over then because I was fine. Right. Yeah, the movie was, that's cute, but I was going to be in a band now. Mm-hmm. And that's when I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina to become part of uh, Maria Howell and the 7th Street Band. Outstanding. So, yeah. okay. So what was it like seeing yourself on screen the Frightening. first time? Frightening. Why? It was, it was very huge. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was uh, surreal. It was very surreal. Um, I remember when my dad, my whole family, we had a Charlotte premiere. And um, mm-hmm. I remember my dad got up out of the theater. He had to walk out of the theater. He was crying. It was like, oh, oh. yeah. It was surreal, but I had to go back again to see the movie because I did not know that was the the climax of the movie. I had Mm -hmm. no idea that was the pivotal shift. And to be in a theater and you, and that was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I was told, I mean, so many parts got cut out and see, I was just a featured extra. So everybody was talking about what got cut out of the movie. And so I didn't even really expect to be in the movie. Mm-hmm. you know, in the final analysis. And then when I saw that, it's like I had the big, I'll never forget, I had the biggest headache. I was crying. I was oh, I was overjoyed. I was, it was all kinds of stuff going on inside of me. Yeah, mm. all kinds of stuff. So, was- so there's, um, so San, uh, Sandra Coble brings up, and this is a good point, because I don't think a lot of people knew this, that several parts of the Color Purple were filmed in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, where was that? Church. Was that church scene filmed in North Carolina? Oh well, yeah, everything that I did was in North Carolina. A big chunk of it was in North Carolina, and we're talking uh, Wadesboro. Um, mm-hmm. you, let's just say Union and Anson counties, because mm-hmm. I think Marshville. Uh, you remember that scene? Is it Marshville? Is that the name mm-hmm. of the city? Yeah. Um, I don't know why I'm acting like I have amnesia now. Um, but the scene where Oprah is hit by the mayor. Uh, mayor's mm-hmm. the mayor. It is. Mm-hmm. That scene, if you are driving down 74 and you look in the Marshville downtown area, that's the street where they, they filmed that scene. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so and, was, mm-hmm. No, go ahead. No, I was saying the church was actually picked up and brought out to the field. It was an old church that didn't have electricity. So. Wait, wait. What do you mean picked up? <laughs> you know how they could pick a trailer up and drive it out somewhere? What? They did that to the church because... The church and the juke joint and that field with the all of that was kind of in close proximity. Mm-hmm. You know, it just takes a camera to turn this way or turn that way. And then you got a whole other world. So, yeah, I learned a lot. You know, being in the business now, you you, you kind of can 
you can figure a lot of things out. But yeah, all of that stuff was very close to each other. Yeah. So we got a couple of questions and I see people checking in from Memphis, Seattle. Um, one of the questions, um, and I'm going to ask you this now because I'm going to ask probably a deeper a, a, a piggyback to this, but wanted to know, are you working on any Broadway album, on broad, working on any Broadway projects or any albums right now? No Broadway projects as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, any day could change anything. Um, right. I have a couple of things in the can that um, will be coming out um, as far as film, because I, I kind of merged over more to TV and film and commercial right. than I do uh, stage. Mm -hmm. Being in Los Angeles, that's more of the mecca for TV and film and commercial voiceover work. So I do a lot, these days I'm doing a lot of voiceover work, um, mm. constantly auditioning for that, which could go anywhere from narration to video games to ebooks to regular commercials and, and whatever. Outstanding. So, mm -hmm. I got to pop this up because I think this is so true. Shout out to namesake Yolanda. How you doing, sis? But mm -hmm. she said your scene was one of the all time favorites of the film. You refer to refer to it as a climax and it clearly was. And I think it's so incredible to hear you say that you didn't even know <laughs> that it was going to be that huge of a scene because it shapes every everybody's lives change from the time you open your mouth <laughs> to the time that it climaxes and every and you know sug and dad hug and everybody's crying and you can't you cannot forget that scene because i mean it changes everything as far as um the storyline itself but it's such energy i even remember i'm about to age myself mm -hmm. in high school oh mm -hmm. my gosh <laughs> so the movie came out in 85 mm -hmm. right and so I remember in high school, we had this Ebony Heritage Club. We did this play and all this other stuff. And we had a, a color purple-esque type scene where the choir was singing. But the, the difference was that the um, one of the, I, I played one of the lead characters, but she had to cry. Like I had to cry. Like, mm -hmm. I don't really know how to do that. But it was something about that song being sung like right before. Mm -hmm. Boy, I was bawling, falling out on the floor <laughs> crying. But it's just something about that song and that scene, mm -hmm. um, just not just the words, but just how it makes you feel mm -hmm. when you see it. And so mm -hmm. to know at that point, what are you in, in your early 20s at that point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're early in your early 20s at that point. Having such a tremendous impact is, is just incredible. Mm -hmm. So, um, if, again, if you're watching, if you have questions for Maria, drop them in the comments. If you're watching a watch party, drop them in the comments. We can see the or I can at least see the watch party. But if you definitely have questions, drop them in and we'll get to you. All right. So Color Purple his Now you're in a band. Mm -hmm. Yes, honey. So I then but, <laughs> yes, like, because that's because you were in Charlotte for years. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and I think a lot of people will remember you um, from, you know, doing that piece as far as the music. But were you still traveling outside of the band and, and getting into the acting piece more? Or was it primarily music then? Really interesting question, because the first five, I think it was the first five years I was in the band. I didn't even concentrate on acting. Wow. The Color Purple launched my singing career. Acting, mm -hmm. too, but singing. And then for five years, I was full time singing because all I ever wanted to do was just sing. And then um, right. then it kind of slowly migrated back into that um, area of acting. Started doing mm -hmm. a few commercials here. I think my second um, job was maybe about five years later. And that was with George Lucas. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. That was the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. And mm -hmm. that's where I met Keith David mm -hmm. and Jeffrey Wright. And uh, Forrest Whitaker has a brother. Uh, named Damon Whitaker. All of us became fast friends on that set. And uh, so, yeah, that and then after that period, I just went full blown into acting and singing. Mm -hmm. And so how are you managing that? Were you bi-coastal at that point between yep. East Coast and West Coast or were you West Coast? Still East Coast. Still East Coast. A lot of things were filmed back in the day. A lot of things were filmed in North Carolina, mm -hmm. like in Wilmington. So um, the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, that was in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And then I did something else. And I think they did that around the Charlotte area um, that was with Gerald McCraney and, um, oh my God, so many names. It's Alicia Silverstone. I got kind of spoiled earlier. And I say spoiled loosely because I don't think I'm spoiled in, in that mm -hmm. sense. But the fact that 
my first forays with acting were with Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and, you know, those kinds of folks. And I'm going, okay, this is the way it's supposed to be. Little did I know that was not normal in the Mm -hmm. normal sense of the word. So um, I I got taught very well because Steven Spielberg can make anybody look like a great actor. Mm -hmm. I give him credit. He's an amazing director. Amazing. And, and like I said, I, I didn't know the whole full, the, the full spectrum of that scene simply because I was a featured extra and they don't allow the full script to those of us. Mm-hmm. So I only saw my scene. That's why I didn't know at the time. Now, when you read a full script, you do have that kind of information. You know? Absolutely. And so what about, so tell us about the other movie projects that you were involved in after that. And then let's talk about your foray into television as well. Okay. Um, it was mostly, oh gosh, I'm trying to think here. Um, I, I did, did, oh God, after, after the, the film with Alicia Silverstone, I moved to New York. That's what it was. I started doing a little bit more television cause I said, well, let me just take this trip to New York. And, and that's when I really wanted to start doing some Broadway. Okay. Um, Broadway is, is serious. It's serious. I mean, you're constantly auditioning. And if you're not in it to win it and, and have that perseverance, don't get into it. <laughs> right. Because you're going to you're going to have a lot more no's than you have yeses. But during that time, I came back. I think about a year later, I came back down to North Carolina. I was I was kind of New York and North Carolina. Mm-hmm. I had the opportunity to work with Maya Angelou. I played her daughter in a play by the um, I think it's a Charlotte Black Rep Theater. I think mm-hmm. that was the official name of it. So I did a play with her. And then after that, I, you know, did a few other things. And then I moved to, to uh, Japan. Oh, I missed that. Okay. Mm-hmm. For six years. Mm-hmm. And I was mostly singing there. I did a couple of commercials there, uh, believe it or not. Um, mm-hmm. I was writing songs and I was also singing full time there. Mm-hmm. That was a whole wonderful experience. But those six years took me away from acting once again. So I was like five years of a break since The Color Purple. Then I did a few little acting jobs, you know, and then I had a six year break. So there you go. I had these breaks. <laughs> right. So still calling you, though. Mm-hmm. Definitely still calling you. Yeah. And so from Japan back to the States, mm-hmm. back to Atlanta. That's where I went next. And then okay. that's when I really started um, getting more into television and commercials. I started doing things uh, with Tyler Perry. Um, I did the first original uh, Meet the Browns. Uh, there was one particular version of it that before HD that they didn't even air. You know, he did a whole other. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. wow. And so Meet the Browns and uh, House of Pain mm-hmm. and Daddy's Little Girls, as well as some other projects. Um, Vampire Diaries. I mean, there, there, Atlanta had a lot going on. Oh, I still has a lot going on. But I'm saying when I moved to Atlanta, there was a lot going on. So a lot of my acting career was built there. Mm-hmm. So it, I was I was keeping pretty busy. And and what? go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was saying even being based in Atlanta at that time, I was still traveling out. I would go. I mean, it could be South Carolina. It could be Louisiana. It could be several places mm-hmm. um, because I worked with Regina King in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. I think there was New Orleans, yeah. So it, I was in the region. It would be Virginia, uh, wherever mm-hmm. in that the southeastern region, until I moved to Los Angeles. And that's mm-hmm. and is that your your last move? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm by coastal Los Angeles and the East Coast, North Carolina. Very good. So mm-hmm. now I know you don't want to name names, but you're gonna have to. So <laughs> favorite movie project. Favorite Ooh. television project that you've done? Oh my God, that's hard. I know it's so much. It's so much. For the sake of 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 sentimentality, did I make up a word? I think so, but you know what? We are gonna roll with it. You it's know what I mean. You can do what you want to do. Sentimental reasons. Um, the color purple, of course. I mean, mm-hmm. that's no brainer because that started everything, and and it really launched this love of wanting to act uh, in me that I didn't know I had. Mm-hmm. Um, and the favorite television show you asked me? Mm-hmm. I'll give you two because you've done a lot of television. Okay, okay you've done a lot of television. So I might even give you three. We're gonna we're gonna give you okay two and a half. Ooh, that's a hard one. That's that's really a hard one. And the reasons I would name these projects 
is simply because it was like a bucket list item. Mm -hmm. Young Indiana Jones Chronicles was one because it was my first opportunity to have more than one uh, episode of anything. Mm -hmm. uh, my what was your character for people who, who hit, hadn't seen it? Goldie. Okay. Goldie. And yeah. it was crazy because there's a choir scene in that too. Mm -hmm. So I played the part of Goldie. Um, there is another one, which is, it was on NBC, Revolution. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed Revolution because I had more than two episodes. I was in mm -hmm. two seasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and I don't want to make it sound like it's about the volume or the frequency. It, it's just the fact that I was able to sink my teeth into it and really live in the moment and moments and get deeper into my character and have arts, things of that nature. Um, so I think the third one was The Hunger Games, Catching Fire. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. Who is your yeah. character? I was Cedar. Mm -hmm. District 11. And it was, yes. because my birthday is May 11. So I just thought that was so special that I'm in District 11. But that's where all the us came from. <clears throat> anyway, in, in Catching Fire. But that was a great experience simply because it showed me what big budget means. Mm -hmm. I won't even talk about that. I'm going to leave that And alone. that one was filmed here in North Carolina, too. Or we, I know the, one of them was. That was the first one. Okay. The second one, uh, that's, that's Hunger Games. But Hunger Games Catching Fire, which was a second book, mm -hmm. was filmed in Georgia mostly in Georgia oh. and some in Hawaii. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, nice. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go to Hawaii because I can't swim underwater. <laughs> <laughs> we just going to leave that. We're going to yeah, leave right. that alone. It's <laughs> fine. It's fine. OK. And so out of the volume of work that you've done um, from from music to television to Broadway, obviously, to movies, what would you say to someone, a, a young young woman specifically, say mm -hmm. teenage, early, early 20s, that is that has a desire because things have changed so much, but that has a desire to sing and act? Um, what advice would you give them? Well, the first thing I always give everybody is know what your calling is, because a lot of us chase dreams and chase these things when they're really not our calling. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes you set yourself up for, I'm not saying don't do things that are passionate to you, but right. I'm saying know what your calling is so that you'll understand what your path is and what, what you're supposed to be doing in whatever passion or discipline that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, not comparing yourself to others is a huge thing. Right. Don't, 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 don't waste your time. Know who you are, know what your calling is and move forward from that in faith. Um, learn as much as you can about the business. Mm -hmm. Please have a mentor. And a mentor could be a working actor. If you're going into acting, if you're singing, get a, get somebody that sings or a working person because they can give you in the moment information. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? For sure. Trinavia asks, what's your favorite, what's your favorite platform? Television, movies, or stage? You want Maria's answer or you want a professional answer? Well, she didn't say which answer to give, so we're gonna let you give us both. I'm going good. That's good and diplomatic. Mm -hmm. The Mar the Maria answer would be, uh, is that paying? <laughs> okay. The professional answer would be, it. You know, honestly, all of them. I don't really have a preference any preference anymore as far as what I love. Mm -hmm. Now, if it comes down to trivial things like, do I feel like putting makeup on? Mm -hmm. Then voiceovers would be it because I'm not a big makeup wearer. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's something about um, how much prep work I have to do, then I say singing mm -hmm. because singing is like second nature. Right. You know, so it, and if I want to be challenged, then definitely TV and film um, because I got to memorize lines. I got to deal with blocking when I get on the sets. I got to deal with travel. It's so many um, uh, moving parts. So it, I th all of them, you know, one, I think once you get deeper into any one of them, you just figure out how you navigate. And so it becomes, I guess that's when they say you become more of a professional. You don't, you don't complain. You just do what you do. Mm. Mm -hmm. So as we're talking about jazz itself specifically, mm -hmm. you consider yourself a song stylist because if anyone has seen you perform, mm -hmm. you can take 
the ABCs and make that thing do what it do. <laughs> I mean, seriously, if you've never seen her perform, like you have to go see her perform. I think the last time I saw you perform was just pre-COVID. Okay. Um, up here at Middle C Jazz, you and Noel performed. And it was just, it was just like you just relaxing. And it was just, it was so easy. It was, it was fun. We could see your personalities. Um, I know you and Noel have worked together. I'm gonna get to that in a second. Um, looks like forever. Um, but if you've not seen her, you've got to do yourself a favor and go, see, go see you live. Um, but what's the difference? Like if you, what to, to someone who doesn't know the difference between, for example, a singer versus a song stylist, what's the difference? Well, a singer is a singer. That's kind of self-explanatory. I, I consider my definition of a song stylist is even if you're doing an original or you're doing a cover song, you take that song and you make it your own. You interpret it. You, you basically are telling a story um, and just giving yourself the freedom, poetic justice, if you will, of how you want to deliver that thing. Um, I will we'll take a song, for example. Um, Oh, let me try now. Just give her a give me an example and not give us a get of course. give us a of course. Of course. Like if like say for example, if there's a song that's a pop song and I want to turn it into jazz, give it a jazzy flair, like um I see us in the park strolling the summer days of imaginings in my head and the words from my heart. I just do my own thing with it. So I can mm -hmm. start so <laughs> <style. laughs> or, or I can take something and scat on it. Okay. You know, um, let me try to think um, like, uh, um, um, uh, what's it? Let's stay together, Al Green. Let's take it this way. I, mm, 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 mm. I'm so in love with you, so I can swing it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so in love with you, and plus that I recorded that as a jazz version, and then I can scat on it. So that's song styling. Mm. It hears it. That's how my heart feels it. So I just kind of play with it. And the cool thing about working with Noel is. He gives me that room and that space to explore in the moment. And that's the cool thing about jazz. It's very improvisational mm -hmm. and kind of like that. So question to the audience as we kind of spend a little bit of time on the music side. What is it that you love about jazz? Like, what is it that you truly love about the genre, the art form, all of that? And then we're going to circle back around, drop it in the comments. But for you, um, a lot of people are used to the different variations of when you come out on stage, it's a jazz feel, but obviously you have the ability to do any type of, any type of music. Mm -hmm. But what is it about jazz that you love personally? And who do you think the true trailblazers have been in say the past 10 to 15 years mm -hmm. um, as far as the genre is concerned? Well, first and foremost, the freedom to answer your first question. Mm -hmm. I love the freedom of it. I love the spontaneity the fact that we have a blueprint, but we can go outside the lines and that we know where to come back to. That's always been a thing. Uh, you know, the jam sessions when, you know, sitting in is a big thing when it comes to jazz. Like I might call somebody up and then, and everybody doesn't have the skill. I learned later in life. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody that intimidates a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I feel very confident that I could go anywhere on the face of this earth and someone would ask me to come sit in on stage and I get up and I do what I do. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as influences, that's whew, that's a toughie because we have so many good ones out there. Um, Liz Wright, I, I come to her. She's she's amazing. Um, and though a lot of people probably would not consider her jazz, but Lettucey is one of my favorites. Oh, yes, honey. One of my favorites. Because Lettucey, even though it may be R&B, she has a lot of jazzy um, uh, sensibilities about her where she's free and, you know, she she just takes it wherever. Another one of my newer favorites is um, Cy Smith, who's actually visited Charlotte on several occasions. And she sings with Chris Bodie. Um, she's amazing. So those are three that I think of right away. Now, of course, if we want to go back in history when it comes to jazz and song stylists. Nancy Wilson's at the top of my list, though she wasn't a jazz singer per se. Mm -hmm. She's a song stylist. 
uh, Sarah Vaughn, of course. Um, oh gosh, so many, so many. Um, and we can go Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, we can go to all of them. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, they're like a big melting pot. Of course, um, Diane Reeves. Mm. Don't let me start talking. Mm -hmm. And Dee Dee Bridgewater. I mean, there's too many to name, to be honest about it. Who is your, do you have a favorite out of that list? Um, Nancy Wilson. Mm. And the reason why I say that is because she looked so wonderful as, as this, it's like she, she had the grace and the style. Mm -hmm. She had a very distinctive voice. She had, she, she did all the genres because she was a pop singer. She was also a, a, a soul singer. She was also a jazz singer. She was everything. And so I'm one of those that I, even like my drummers, I always uh, joke and say, a drummer is good with me if you can play all the genres mm -hmm. because I may jump from one thing to another. Right. And so she, she embodied a lot of that for me, you know. Absolutely. And so what I, one of the things I admire about a lot of your work, especially in the middle of the pandemic, is when you and Noel started the free concerts, if you will, to help out Middle C mm -hmm. Jazz um, to, you know, help them during the time when everything was closed. And what I enjoyed about watching them, it was again, it was just free flowing. You could mm -hmm. it looked like it was just somebody would yell out a song and you would make it do what it do. And it was just incredible to watch. When you now you how long have you and Noel been um, performing together? Ten years now. Oh wow! And mm -hmm. so for people who don't know who he is, mm -hmm. Noel Line. Mm -hmm. um, he is a wonderful composer, um, pianist, and singer. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's he's also an educator because he uh, teaches classes at a a private uh, college prep school, Davidson Day, mm -hmm. and had uh, been teaching at Cent uh, um, UNCC as well. Um, mm -hmm. music, I think business and music or something like that. Yeah. So he's very originally from Kansas. I think I can't remember where Noah's from. He's Kansas or Kansas. Midwest. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but he's been in Charlotte for quite a while. And so I met him as we were doing a uh, jazz at the Beckler Museum series. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Seattle Rivia brought us together and everybody's like, when I would come back and forth to North Carolina so frequently, they were like, you really need to meet Noah Friedline. Mm -hmm. We met and that was it. I love it. I love it. And so when you're performing now, do you have a favorite song or is it just too many? Do you have a favorite song that you love to perform? Too many. Yeah. What's the one that gets requested the most then? Mm. I don't know that one gets requested the most, to be honest with you. Um, because we do concepts of, of shows Mm -hmm. We have the Stevie Wonder show, which we'll be doing, and I'll get back to that. We'll be doing that, in, uh, not this weekend, but next weekend at Middle C for their first mm -hmm. anniversary. Um, we have Carpenter King and Simon, which Noel and myself, we came up with. That's Carly Simon, Carol King, and um, Karen Carpenter. So we jazz that up. Um, there's a Billy Joel and an Elton John show. There's a... Ooh. There's a Earth, Wind and Fire slash Chicago show. Earth, Wind and Fire, Chicago, Blood, Sweat and Tears. Mm. And I love the music of Chicago and Earth, Wind and Fire. So, I mean. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. All right, so when, so when you're performing, um, do you find yourself ever getting emotional? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is it, how do you control that so that you are able to still still perform, but still, you know, feel that emotion as well. Oh, yes. After you've done it so long, you you realize you can't sing and cry at the same time. So you just make a decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember. But, you can, but it wouldn't really be cute, you know, and there's and all, yeah, that yeah, you got makeup and then it's just a hot mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Early, earlier on, though, I actually would get so emotional about a song that I would cry and and I realized you can't do this. That's not gonna work. So I figured it out. You know, yeah. you just figure it out. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm not gonna say who, but you're gonna say when I tell you who it is, um, she says her favorite one is natural woman. She says she requested all the time. That must be Sharon John. Yes, ma'am, it is. That's the most hey girl, hey. That's the most requested song. <laughs> yes. Can we can we get a, a bar or two? Just can can we? I don't know, let me help. Looking out on the morning rain.
pain. I used to feel so uninspired when I knew I had to face another day. Lord, it made me feel so tired. Before the day I met you, life was so unkind. You're the key to my peace of mind. Cause you make me feel, you make me feel, you make me feel like a natural woman. Yes, honey. I wanted to do, I wanted so bad to do the do. I couldn't do it though. I couldn't do it. <laughs> See, that's, that's the next show. That's the next show, and he just <laughs> point to me, and I'll do it, and then I'll go like run away. <laughs> I thought to get Sharon on stage a couple times to do that. Oh, have you? Yeah. Have you? Yes. Yeah, and I go. We go way back. We go way back. <laughs> and she said she was singing with you. So, I know she was. Of I course. Know. Okay, so um, as far as as far as what's going on with you now, so mm -hmm. I, for people who don't know, and we still have a, a few more minutes, if you have a couple quick questions, you can drop them in the comments. But if they're not already following you, definitely got to be, they definitely need to be following you on Instagram at Maria Sings Acts. Mm -hmm. Or is this the same on Twitter? It's the same on Twitter. Okay. And on Facebook, it's Maria Howell fan page. Okay. So they can't be rolling up on your personal page, but they can like the fan page. If they, go, if they go to MariaHowell.com, they can reach all those, those platforms. All of those, yes. So mm -hmm. tell us what do you have coming up here um, that we can see you at least locally here in the Charlotte area or if you are traveling to other places because okay. like I, I'm telling y'all, if you haven't experienced her live, it is an experience, I'm telling you. Okay, so what do you have coming up? Well, the 19th, 20th and 21st will be at Middle C celebrating their first year anniversary because Noel and I opened up the club um, in November of 2019. I was there. Anyway, go ahead. And so here we are. Um, we're going to do the Stevie Wonder show, which is amazing. And a uh, mm -hmm. dear, dear friend of mine from Atlanta who used to perform with Elton John, Adam McKnight, will be joining us. So um, after that, Noel and I will be working on our, We last year we did our first annual Christmas concert at the McGloin Theater. But during this pandemic, we'll be filming it. Okay. So that's something else that's coming up. Um, you can kind of tune into my website. I've got a merch line out. Um, so it's called my, the Maria Howell Collection. You can look at my, my social media and find that as well. And I've got a couple of other things that I'm looking forward to. I'll, I'll leave that in the can. But you could probably go back, go back on Hallmark. There's a film I did last year that they've been playing a lot this year, again, called a Christmas Love Story that stars Kristen Chenoweth. And um, that's a beautiful uh, Christmas story. So, and what's your role in that in that particular movie? Um, I'm trying to think of what my name was. That's so sad. <laughs> that's so sad. I like that though. I like being in this position where I can't where I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what my name was. But it's uh, I played the uh, personal assistant to her love interest mm -hmm. in the movie. It's a really cute story. Hallmark. And it's Hallmark. They'll show it 18,723 times. That part. Then they've been showing it. I know because this interrupted my Golden Girls that I normally watch at <laughs> some 10 o'clock on. So I'm, I'm just salty. Like, I'm happy for you. I'm <laughs> salty that I can't see my Golden Girls and It's personal. Oh, Y'all let me have my moment. Okay, that's I'm good. good. The, that's but, the Golden Girls is all that now. I, 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 okay. 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 Yeah. So November 19th through the 21st and Middle C Jazz, they yeah. can go to, is it middlecjazz.com to get tickets? They can go there or they can go on Facebook and go Middle C Jazz. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, limited, definitely safe, socially mm -hmm. distant. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and the, the, this, this is another thing too, I like people to know. We've really been building up the live streaming. So out of that Thursday, Friday and Saturday night show, the set of shows, Friday and Saturday nights will be streamed. So oh, if, you, wow. if they go on the site and I'll be posting everything about that, there are five different opportunities, four out of the five, they'll be able to live stream. And it's all Stevie Wonder. You're going to blow the roof off that sucker. Oh my God, I can't we wait. Finished, we just finished doing the show down in Hilton Head at the Jazz Corner. And after the first song, there was a standing ovation. Wow. Yeah. One of my friends, Paul mm -hmm. Williams, told me he saw you down in um, 
he he's he's my my golf coach. He told me to tell you something to ask you about something, something crazy. He probably said to you, I don't know, and oh, he hasn't commented, but uh, he he's just said he saw you down at, at Hilton Head, and it was an incredible show. So definitely, if you are not already following, follow her at Maria Sings Acts. Go check out the the clips. Um, go check out Hunger Hunger Games Catching Fire. Obviously, all of the projects that you have been involved in over the years. Um, did you say that there's an album coming or you just said you're working on something? Well, we got the Christmas album from okay. last year that we're going to be pumping out again this year, and which is amazing, um, mm -hmm. if I say so myself, because I actually listen to it all year round. Because mm -hmm. I've always wanted to sing and have strings in the background, mm -hmm. part of the orchestra. So they granted mm -hmm. strings on this last recording. So, But you can find those things on my website as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Is your tour schedule up there? Because somebody's asking, are you doing anything upstate um, in Jersey or New York or anything? Not yet. Yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Gotcha. And are there any television projects or is that everything kind of on hiatus with everything? It, that's going on? It, they've started working everything out again. I've started auditioning again for TV and film because they just now started opening everything back up in Los Angeles and they already did in Atlanta. And mm -hmm. there, are few, there are a few films being uh, shot in the Charlotte area, actually. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. Oh my God. There's a there's a TV show um, that's going to be coming up that's on the Oprah Winfrey Network mm -hmm. that's going to be shot here right in Charlotte. Outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. So, so all of those aspiring actors and people behind the scenes, because I always encourage people learn to write, start mm -hmm. writing, learn how to do other parts of the industry so that you you know can be involved. So I encourage people that want to be involved, mm -hmm. get involved. Absolutely. Now, I did ask you earlier, um, and if you guys didn't catch that, catch that question where I asked as far as what advice you would give to someone. Mm -hmm. But what's the biggest lesson you learned um, over the course of the years that you wish you had known? Um, <laughs> did you see my do we need, I, right. Do you need? Like, I, a couple of I think it twitched a little bit, Maria. Oh, my God. Okay. 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 Come back to reality. Okay. That's <laughs> The biggest lesson I have learned, mm -hmm. mm. put God first. Mm. I'm just going to say it flat out. Mm -hmm. Too many of us in the industry are a little apprehensive to talk about God mm -hmm. and talk about the importance of having your spirituality intact, in place, having a relationship so that when these other things fall apart or they get kind of cray cray, that you don't go cray cray yourself. That's the biggest lesson. I've always been a faith-based person, but I don't believe I had my my that foundation strong enough to take me, you know, through some some of the rough spots. Mm. And there have been some rough spots. I know this. I know this cute little face look like I've been washing and conditioning it type thing. I know it doesn't look beat up, but inside I've had some serious serious lessons to learn. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm being transparent as much as possible when I talk to people and I mentor people. This is what happens. This is what this is. This is what this looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to don't lose yourself in the process. That's why it's so important to keep God first, because it's easy to get lost in all of the glitz and glamour and expectations. That's yeah. why you have to have that firm foundation for sure. Absolutely. Very wise words indeed. So thank you. You're so welcome. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. So if you are tuning in late, you can go back and catch the replay for sure. It'll be on YouTube and Facebook. November the 19th through the 21st, Maria is going to be at Middle C Jazz. Listen, I'm trying to tell y'all, y'all think I, I can't tell you. Listen, <laughs> you need to go see her live if you're in the Charlotte area. Um, is it MariaHowell.com for the website? Mm -hmm. That's my okay, so MariaHowell.com. She's got merch and um, goodies out there for you. But definitely let's support our live venues, too, because Middle C mm -hmm. is an excellent venue. We've got to support live music. Obviously, we're in the midst of a pandemic um, and to obviously do that safely and responsibly. But live music is still here. So let's definitely make sure that we're supporting mm -hmm. our artists for sure. Um, shout out to all the sorrows out there that are catching this either live or on a replay. You know, we had to do it. You already know. OK. All right. But listen, <laughs> next week we'll be back. I'm not going to announce who's going to be on the show just yet because we, we're going to we're going to play around with that date. But it'll still be Wednesday at eight o'clock live. 
Obviously, if you haven't done so already, as always, make sure you like, follow, and subscribe at everything at the Combo Pod Show. Maria, thank you so much. You are a joy. You are an absolute joy. Thank you. Thank you. Keep it going, girl. I shall. I shall. Thank y'all for tuning in, and we will see you next week. Good night.